The top speed of the pod is about um, 25 kilometers an hour. That's not where we're going to be operating the range of, but that's what is potential. And it can do about 35 kilometers uh, on a single charge. Um, so more than enough getting up and down this, the uh, Milton Central for quite a few hours. So we've got about 10 on site today, and so we also use all of the containers you can see behind us. And the containers are for two reasons, obviously storage is one, but the second is, as you can observe from the video, it's quite a barren site, and so it doesn't really mimic a city centre very well. So they're strategically placed uh, for the LiDAR. So in town, um, when we're driving around, there's always going to be walls, uh, buildings and trees to bounce off, and that's how you navigate um, through LiDAR. But, um, so that's where we are. So you create a map. So you have to travel around a couple of times. Um, you could do it off one, but um, one doesn't work very well because if there's something in the way, say a bird in LiDAR or someone standing in the way, that would be picked up in as, as, a, as an environment. And then when the pod would travel around, it would be looking for that person again. So you've got to do it a couple of times um, to basically remove them and only get static features that are always going to be there. So there's a couple of things, a couple of sensors here. That's the LiDAR up there. So that is our navigation LiDAR. So that's bouncing off the containers. That's how it navigates. We also will have the LiDAR down here. We're currently looking at different types. So there are internal LiDARs, indoor LiDARs, and there are external LiDARs. Um, and as you can imagine, internal LiDARs don't deal with sunlight very well. Um, so that's why we're having to experiment with um, outdoor LiDARs and um, basically find the one that best suits our needs. There's thousands of different applications for a LiDAR and there's quite a few makers, so we're finding the right ones. The whole reason for our project, the goal is to uh, make them affordable to councils. You know, budgets can't, they're not limitless. Um, so we're trying to find a way, how do you provide an excellent service with good quality whilst remaining like attainable for councils really. Um, so there's a lot of options for LiDAR as you can probably imagine. And it's finding which one suits our needs, which one, uh, performs well without going beyond the grasp of like council budgets basically. Where do we start with this? How do we go for a ride? We're going to have a QR code scanner here um, and you would provide it, you use your phone to uh, access the pod. We have buttons on the inside and the outside um, so they open the doors and so we would we would get in and it would know that you're in because you scan. For the purposes of the video, we're going to show it on a laptop because it's easy to see. You look like you've got an Xbox controller, yeah, right? Yeah, with most heavy machinery and, and test, uh, test vehicles, you have a, a dead man switch. Um, so that's if anything goes wrong or some reason we need to stop, um, you let go of the trigger and it, and it stops. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm not controlling the vehicle. I'm just holding the, uh, the dead man. We're off. It's about a kilometre track of our site, and as you can see on the laptop now, so you're seeing our viz. The circles are each waypoint, and so waypoints have a location on the X, Y, and Z, and they also have a speed, and that's the speed of the pod as it goes through it. We would map the centre in LiDAR, and you would also map it through waypoints. It would then compute its own route if you wanted to go from one specific place to another. There would be waypoints for that, so we need to map the whole centre, basically. Um, and so right now it's um, got about 60 waypoints for our site um, and this is about two meters a second and the idea of the project is to basically be twice walking speed that's what the uh, the council specifications we want, and that's what we want to do because uh, we're operating on redways they're still open to the public and cyclists um, so there's an appropriate speed that we need to follow in. We go out to the train station where there's lots and lots of people and uh, we've offered a few people that so far. There's a big Santander HQ here, um, so we've had many people of, of them. Um, people always want a waypoint to Weatherspoons um, <laughs> on a Friday evening. Quite soon we're going to be doing uh, autonomous trials outside in the uh, in, in public. Uh, we're going to start with no passengers and then we're going to slowly add passengers and more stops to our trials. Um, we envisage a I think we've coined a pod club, so we're going to take 100 people for a kind of beta phase um, so they'll be able to trial the vehicles with destinations they'd like on our, on our circuit. And by September we hope to offer a public service. It's quite bumpy, isn't it? Yeah, so the site's been abandoned since Milton Keynes was built, so it's had 50 years of misuse really, uh, particularly this section, so this is very bumpy. But uh, the site offers just over a kilometre of private track um, and it's in such perfect location. It's quite bumpy here. In a way it's quite good because this is much worse than um, 
any of the redways we'd be running in, so we can really put the pod through its paces here. It's a proper test track. Yeah, a proper test track, exactly. And if it can deal with this, it will have absolutely no problem out in the centre. You're travelling along and you suddenly realise that you need to go to the shop. What do you do? Yep. <laughs> can you stop me? <laughs> we have a, so obviously has a built-in cancel feature. And so that's part of why we're here later uh, in the coming months. We're going to be talking with the public a lot. Um, and part of that point is um, getting their feedback and seeing what they'd like to see. Um, so we've already started that. So we've talked about you know the QR scanner and um, ease of use, um, also ramps for the vehicle. So if you were um, in a wheelchair, you could as easily access it as um, as anyone else. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that because it's going to be a chance to um, let the public really um, have a look, tear down of the vehicle. Because um, you can have the uh, you can have what exactly what you think works, but it's always good to get the. Uh, the public who will eventually be the end users of it to uh, have their say. This is the software used for the pod to navigate and so this ties directly into all of the internals, so the steering controller, the brakes, all of that is, is controlled from here. So if I zoom in on uh, one particular waypoint, so this is waypoint one, as you can see so it's got two meters a second so that's the speed it's going to go through this uh, arrow and you can place them with a uh, with a 2d nav goal and give it its orientation and then the important bit is you've got to compute before every route this is the loop it's going to do you're probably wondering what all of these lines are so this is actually the lidar map so this is how it navigates so each rectangle here is one of the containers when we're driving in lidar it's looking for these objects the dark black outlines are something it's 100 percent sure is there there's very um, little kind of pass through it's all reflected um, and so that's ideally what what we'd aim for um, the gray so it's on a kind of black scale so the gray is is something it's less sure so if you did it right through a window it would come out gray because some gets reflected because it's not a solid object and white obviously it ignores so that's shooting into open space and you uh you can't navigate off that um, <laughs> so sometimes you do pick up uh, a bush but because the bush is quite large and it's not going anywhere um, it's actually quite a good um, uh, navigational feature so looking at that, that map there yeah obviously those are good landmarks but looks like the majority is done by GPS, would that be right? Uh, this, this right now is only running off GPS. Right. That loop just then was um, purely off GPS because that's what we're working on today. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, uh, so we, that's what I was saying, so we're in the process of kind of tying them together um, because right now we're confident that it can navigate off GPS alone and it can navigate off LiDAR. Um, and as we're meshing it together, we're also um, going to start doing autonomous runs in Milton Keynes. Um, and so the, the, GP, the GPS is um, so it's obviously via satellite at the base station, um, but it communicates through a network. So is that a, that's a mesh network? It's a mesh, yeah. To so make sure that it's got coverage wherever it is? Yeah, we can get a visual representation of the strength of the GPS that we're receiving. The blue is, although it might not come through on the camera, they're individual ticks. So the GPS is in constant communication with uh, the pod. So if, if that blue line disappears, we know we're not getting the coverage we need and the pod will actually stop. Our number one goal right now is to make sure the two bottom levels of navigation, so the LiDAR and the GPS, can navigate independently. Um, and if they can independ independently navigate, um, obviously when you put them together, they're just that more and more safe. So that's the goal right now. So I think the fleet here is about 6,000 kilometers over the last couple of months. And so we're continually building that. They're still building pods in, um, in Coventry and we're shipping them down here um, to put them through the paces. And I should caveat this by saying I'm going to be talking in general terms. Each operating system, whether that's Windows, Linux, Mac OS, iOS, BSD, insert your favorite operating system here that you've probably 